Perspective Shift, Unveiling Paradigms and Perceptions Navigating Christian doctrines can be overwhelming. Returning to biblical interpretation is vital for clarity and unity. Shifting perspectives to align with the Word of God brings authenticity to our faith. Let's seek truth together with open hearts and minds. Perspective Shift with Dare Akinsanya Hello everyone, my name is Dare Akinsoy and welcome to this week's episode of Perspective Shift, Unveiling Paradigms in Perceptions. I am humbled to be your host today. In the previous episode, we examined how Jesus instructed his disciples to gather the leftover food to prevent waste, even though the food was freely given and of course more than enough to meet their needs, but he still had that stewardship mentality of not wasting the food regardless. This noble act demonstrated gratitude for God's provision and the importance of responsible stewardship. In today's episode, we are focusing on a popular phrase which is often applied wrongly or quoted out of place. We continue with our exploration of the story of the feeding of the multitudes as we explore John's account in chapter 6 and verse 2. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were deceased. And John 6.14 Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Here is insight number 22. Seeing is believing. Some of us quote this phrase to give credence to what we see over what we don't see, especially when it relates to God's promises. On the other hand, some of us speak against it both claims are factual, don't get me wrong, except that there is something missing in the way both ideologies are presented. Let us look into this together in this episode, based on God's words. I must emphasize that this should not be confused with the lesson from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, which states that we walk by faith and not by sight. As Christians, we are supposed to walk by faith and not merely by our sight. You may say, well, I'm contradicting myself. No, I am not. As we go through this, we will see what that passage in Second Corinthians was actually referring to. To give a hint, that phrase, walking by faith, is not talking about blinding our eyes to the things that we see with our natural eyes. If we are not to trust what we see with our natural eyes, why do we give testimonies? We give testimonies to help other people believe the power in God's word. In reality, there are things that appear real, but they are just mere mirage. They appear real from afar, but as we get closer, the reality unfolds and we notice that the pool of water that we saw was just a trick on our eyes. This may sound confusing. Like, okay, we believe what we see and we don't believe what we see. What are you talking about? Both insinuations or both assertions of walking not by sight and believe in what we see, both of them are true, but we have to put both of them in the right perspective for it to actually make true sense. Otherwise, it may be misleading and confusing to many. The fact that mirages exist does not negate that there are times where pools of water actually do exist on freeways. What Paul was addressing in that passage is that we need a solid establishment of the truth on a matter and keep our minds focused on that truth. When a situation conflicts with what God tells us, what we are seeing is a mirage at that point, and we must resolve to following what God says about such things or situations. In other words, 
God's word is the truth that we must hold on to. It is not living in denial as unbelievers often argue. It is about holding on to God's truth. We must be careful about how we adopt unbiblical phrases, of course, especially when they conflict with God's words. Seeing is believing is not a quote from the Bible. It's a quote that we humans fabricated. We also must realize that there are some factual quotes that have been taken out of context and used to establish a divine principle. While God can speak to us from a scripture that may not necessarily corroborate the context of the story we got them from, we must be careful not to develop a habit to using them erroneously. For the most part, when we are studying scriptures, we will do ourselves a greater good to understand what God intends to communicate to us from a story and recognize that there is no story in the Bible that is there by accident. A good guideline is a phrase that many evangelicals use. They say a text extracted from a context must be a pretext for a proof text. This implies that when we take any verse or phrase from a story in the Bible, we must strive to understand the underlying content. Once we understand the content, the text we extracted should now be viewed in line with the story, not used in isolation. That is, it must become a pretext for a proof text. Of course, there are exceptions when God can speak to us directly from one verse that means something totally different from the content we extracted them from. Those are usually on individual communication basis not to form an ideology around them. And when we see such scriptures, we will find other scriptures from other places in the Bible that corroborate that particular scripture, even though it is not used in line with the content. It is what many of us call Rema. Becoming too rigid on such content that was drawn out of context at this time makes us no different from the Pharisees and Sadducees who were too dogmatic for the move of God and for their own good. That's why Paul admonished that the letter can kill as it stifles the move of God for a generation when care is not taken to be sensitive to his move or the move of the Holy Spirit. The scenario in Hosea 1 is a good example when God told prophet Hosea to take a prostitute from the street and marry her. Taking this out of context may lead to people saying it is biblical to associate with prostitutes, whereas God was merely trying to convey a hard lesson to Hosea by making him experience the kind of love that he has for men, unconditional kind of love. We must remember that God uses foolish things sometimes to confound the wise, and we can be too dogmatic and become blind to his move at any time. So God told Hosea to name the first daughter Loruhama because he can no longer have mercy on the house of Judah. If we take that in context too, we would have misinterpreted the merciful nature of God. And again, he commanded to name the second child a son, Lohamil, and claim that Judah is no longer his people and he, God, will no longer be their God. Again, if we take that on face value, we would also have misinterpreted the merciful nature of God. We will find these two stories that I've just talked about in Hosea chapter 1 verses 1 through 9. But in verse 10, the narrative changed. Hosea 1.10, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. All of this happened in the same chapter. God says, You are no longer my people. I will no longer have mercy on you. And in the same chapter, it says, You are my people where it has been said that you've been disowned before, scratch that, because I will continue to be your God. 
that is the true nature of God and it takes understanding of God's ways to know when he is just trying to express his dissatisfaction on something we may be doing. He is forever a merciful God. He renews his mercy every single day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. We cannot take his mercy for granted, though. Paul says we cannot continue in sin and wish that grace will continue to abound. That is abusing the love and mercy God bestows on us. Let's take a look at John chapter 2 verse 23 for a minute. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. That is, they believed when they saw. In that context, seeing is believing. The miracle of the supernatural multiplication was not only a miracle they witnessed. Seeing is believing is a true fact. But the major question is, how do we see or with what do we see that influences our beliefs? Are we basing our sight on our senses or on the truth of God's word? Let's clarify one fact quickly. What we believe is different from what we perceive. We perceive with our natural senses, but we see with our hearts. Hence, what we truly see in our heart is actually how we should walk, which is by faith. What we have resolved in our heart is how we see. For example, if you grew up with someone and they transgendered into the opposite sex, you know the person is this sex before they transgendered. Even though the person now looks like the opposite sex, you know who or what gender the person was before they transgendered. How would you now address the person? Some, for example, if it's a transgender woman, some will see a woman and some will see a man. Which is the truth? Likewise, a person that makes $100,000 a month in salary will not consider himself poor. When the account shows red after a hefty transaction, a bystander that has no background about the person will see the account and conclude that the man is poor. But another who has more insight about the person knows that that is not true because he knows this guy has a lot of money. The account is just not showing it at that point in time. And that's why banks don't approve loans based on the current balance in our account. They want to see the cash flow history, not the balance sheet, which is just a snapshot at a particular point in time. In other words, it is not what we perceive with our natural eyes that is what we believe. It is what we perceive with our inner eyes that we have resolved to be true. That is what we truly believe. If we believe what magicians do on their stage and mistake it for divine display of power, <laughs> then we have another thing coming. The magicians themselves openly disclose their acts as tricks but make it so real that many of us gasp for breath at many of those tricks. I learned a trick w with cards a while back when a guy would ask someone to pick a card secretly and make a mental note of that card. They even show the card to witnesses around and place the card in the back of a pile. The guy would always pick out the secret card from the pile to people's amazement. What people didn't know, however, is that the guy was using a proven logic every time that is without fail. Here's how the trick goes. The magician selects 21 unique cards and asks someone to pick one secretly. Once picked, he shuffles the cards and will stack them in piles of three, each containing about seven cards each. He will then take one card each time and restock them in another pile of three and the person will indicate which pile the card is now in. He repeats this about three times. He then 
on the last time we'll pick out the 11th card if it's stack all 21 cards together or if it's just using the pile that was last chosen pick the fourth card that card will always be the card that the person picked this is just a logic as the card gets moved into the middle of the pile each time it stacks them one after the other it's mind-blowing but it's that simple so in essence we have five different senses through which we perceive our environment or surroundings this include the sense of taste the sense of smell, the sense of touch, the sense of sound, and the sense of sight. These are all the things that Paul was referring to as sight. That is when we limit the things we perceive only to these five senses without filtering them through some proven benchmark or proven standard. And for Christians, the Bible is our standard. We can touch a knife and know what it is and confirm it with our eyes that indeed what we touched was a knife. We can also smell beef roasting on a grill and an image of steak forms in our hearts. Genesis 27, 21 through 27. Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may fill you my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy, like his brother's brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, Are you really my son Esau? He said, I am. He said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near, and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothing, and blessed him, and said, Surely the smell of my son is the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. What his senses were telling him did not convey the person that he knew to be his son Esau. So he had doubt, despite all the things that he saw with his natural senses. Even though they proved to look like the son Esau, he knew, based on the standard in his heart, that this doesn't sound right. And that's how the Bible should place checks in our hearts that something doesn't sound right. It's probably not the first time Esau cooked for Isaac, and Rebekah must have been the one that taught Esau also to cook, so he knew what Esau's food would taste like. So he created something similar to what Esau would create. But Isaac hit the nail on the head in verse 35 of the same Genesis chapter 27. When Esau did come back, he realized what had been done. He said, but he said, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. He realized that even though he tried to confirm who Esau was against what his heart told him and confessed that he was deceived. This implies that all the sensory tests he performed on Jacob to convince his heart to adjust to the imposed reality were not full proofs because the truth he knew surfaced eventually when Esau himself appeared. Interestingly, he never performed any test on Esau because the truth resonated in his heart with the presence of Esau. Some of us base all our beliefs on what we see with our natural sight and we don't seek to know the truth from God's word or via the help of the Holy Spirit. For example, fear or doubt is a direct result of something we perceived with our senses that we convinced ourselves to believe in our hearts while ignoring the truth of God's word. We transfer this knowledge into our heart and it becomes the truth that we now believe. But we have just latched on a lie, unbeknownst to us. We saw the evidence and we believed them, but we were looking at the wrong evidences. 
it is our responsibility to seek our truth and hold fast to them. It is not by accident that the Bible wants us to seek the truth out in whatever we perceive through our natural senses. Our resolutions within our mind is what becomes the truth of what we see. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, Test all things, hold fast what is good. 2 Timothy 3.14 But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. It is what we learn with our senses that translates into our beliefs. So seeing is believing applies in two ways. Seen via our inner eye and via our natural eyes. And both ways can maximize their benefits if we adopt them appropriately. What we see is influenced by our perceptions. And what we see influences our belief system. In the context of faith and everyday life, the principle of seeing is believing holds significant weight. Actions that remain unseen or unrecognized despite their quality often fail to reach their full potential. Human nature often re relies on visible evidence to build belief and trust. We see that in John chapter 20, 29, Jesus said to them, Thomas, you have believed because you see me. He said, blessed are those who, who have not seen yet believed. That is, those who didn't rely only on their natural eyes, but see with their eyes of faith. He called them blessed. He didn't condemn Thomas for waiting to see him physically. Rather, he questioned Thomas' faith in the things that he has been teaching the disciples all the while. Jesus understands how humans interpret what we see with our natural eyes, and he admonishes us on how we, the children of light, should portray ourselves to the world. Jesus taught the importance of making our good deeds visible to others, not for personal glory, but to bring glory to God and inspire others. He commanded us to let our light shine before men, that they may see our good works and glorify the Father in heaven. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. While doing good in secret has its place. Actions that are never known or seen by others can have limited potential in influencing or encouraging change. They have to see for them to be influenced and change. Mark 4, 21 through 22. Also he said to them, Is a lamb brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. Jesus, in, in essence, was teaching about branding. For example, while alcohol itself is not a sin, it is misleading when Christians consume alcohol, especially in public spaces. It diminishes our impact on non-believers that we are supposed to be converting to the kingdom. For the holier than thou, everyone has a level of alcohol in our body, even if we never tasted alcohol in our lives. The body breaks a carbohydrates into ethanol, which is a compound of alcohol. Someone with gut microbiome imbalance may be driving under influence without them knowing and fail blood alcohol level test, even when they have never consumed or tasted alcohol ever in their life. This is a result of gut fermentation syndrome that occurs when bacteria and fungi in the gastrointestinal tract are unbalanced and ferment carbohydrates in, in high levels. We can guess what the syndrome is called. Autobrewery syndrome, <laughs> ABS. Quite interesting, isn't it? So when the Bible discourages us from consuming alcohol, it is not because it's a sin. In fact, it said when we consume too much of it is when it is sin. 
but it is unwise for a Christian to be consuming alcohol, especially in public places, and unbelievers see them and confuse them as being yoked together. The Bible says we should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That is, we have to leave a standard that is above their standards so that if we place ourselves high up there, that they are supposed to look up to us and emulate our behaviors, not we being equally yoked with them and emulating their behaviors. That is stooping low. The Bible calls us royalties, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are supposed to demonstrate that level of outlook to influence the world that we have been put here as ambassadors to bring to Christ. For the body of Christ, part of branding includes public testimonies and visible acts of faith. Both of these have power to inspire and convert others. They serve as living evidences of God's power and goodness. What we do that no one knows about or knows the benefit of has very little potentials, even if the product, product is the best there is. That's why word of mouth is often considered one of the most effective marketing strategies because it is authentic and trustworthy and persuasive. Matthew 15:31. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. We must comport ourselves to portray ourselves or our business in ways that what we say matches what we do, because the resolution in people's minds on what or who they think we are is what they actually act upon. Likewise, what we do that no one knows about will remain in obscurity till eternity unless God's mercy prevails. It is our responsibility to tell the world what we do or what we believe. With that said, we cannot get angry or depressed when people boycott our services. We just need to make sure of at least three things with respect to branding, that it is God's purpose for us that we are not experiencing friction from principalities and powers, and that the things we do or say match the perceptions that we want people to see. If people don't want what we are offering, we shouldn't take offense in them. Even if we think they are being malicious, if we are very keen on convincing them, then we must either refine our processes or products and how we brand them to make them appealing to them. We must be conscious, however, that actions appear in two connotations. Two people will do the same exact thing, the same way, and one will be accepted while the other is rejected. Technically, it is not what they did per se that moved the people. It is a belief about our personality or our product that they cannot get past. We also have to know when to stop beating a dead horse with the help of the Holy Spirit, of course. We must turn to the Holy Spirit for guidance so that we are not giving up too early or exerting efforts more than required as I round up tonight. The principle of seeing is believing is a double-edged sword. When we see correctly, our belief system will be healthy. Conversely, it can flaw the algorithms of our belief system. On the other hand, the principle of seeing is believing can highlight the importance of visibility in maximizing the impact of our actions in the world. There is value in humility and sometimes doing good things in secret, but this pertains to our charitable works. The Bible supports the idea that visible deeds, testimonies and examples are crucial for building faith and they influence others and they bring glory to God. But at the same time, actions that remain unseen, despite their quality, often fail to realize their full potentials. Therefore, we are called to let our light shine, demonstrate our faith through visible works, and be examples to others in the communities. And with that, we have come to the end of this week's episode. Please connect with me via ikinsd.com forward slash podcast or through my YouTube podcast channel. 
and thanks for all the testimonies and feedbacks and comments that come my way please keep them coming i am grateful for them and you never know who those comments and testimonies are benefiting or blessing and as always i hope that this episode has been of some value to you and i want to thank you for listening have a great week ahead and remember that jesus is lord of all hallelujah amen Oh, 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 oh,